Okay, folks, here we have the part B of the self-driving car and autonomous vehicle section. Uh, this is all in the part which is dealing with the autonomous vehicles. And here we're going to do the, some more detail about the AI technology and the role of AI, which is actually the heart of the problem. It's the really hard problem. There's lots of other important problems, but they're not really as totally challenging. All right, so here is a sort of starting point. And uh, there's a huge number of um, blogs and articles and tutorials and things. I subscribe to medium.com. I get uh, you know several articles a day just from medium.com. And here is a review of the actual sort of industry battle going on with the all sorts of parts of the industry, the actual automobile industry, various other things, including Waymo, which are parts of Google, and um, parts of Apple, and parts of Facebook. They're all competing in this area. And the ride hailing companies have a major activity uh, because they're all, they're all people who want to be a major player in the most, this emerging mobility um, industry. And here we have a nice. Uh, um, presentation from Princeton about the issues here is a more specialized article on cybersecurity. We really don't want people to be able to hack into our cars when we're doing something dangerous. Uh, the NVIDIA, we'll mention them a little next two or three slides. They have um, a nice open source uh, network for self driving cars, and here is a paper on it, and here is a tutorial on it, and here is yet another tutorial. Then, if we are Trying to sort of do the AI, we have to do lots of things. And these four things here are certainly four of the most important. We have to position the car in the right place. We have to decide how to drive, park planning. That is both tactical, get around the corner, and strategic, get from A to B a million miles away. Then we have to detect objects, the cars, the people, the sides of the roads. And then we also have to tell the road signs. These all have to be done in uh, very quickly. People do it extremely quickly, seconds, or you know, more of a second uh, sort of delay. And uh, cars have to match that time. So these requirements are all real time, and you can't afford to do, put any delay. So these decisions are all largely made on the car itself. The training, the design of the network can be done offline and can involve so-called cloud computing or data center computing. All right, so here we have a piece of hardware that NVIDIA built their tutorial around with three cameras, left, center, and right. And there's a disk to store all the training data, which we use for um, well, all the model data, which we use to inference or training data, which we use if we're trying to um, build the model. And here's the model starting at the bottom here, that's the input. We have 66 by 200 pixels, each in RGB. So three, array three in that, in that in the RGB space. And then we roar up through classic uh, CNN um, so-called convolutional networks, which are identifying the structure in the image. And then we get to a sort of fully connected networks at the end, which extract information. See, so we have fully connected convolutional. One, two, three, four, five, five convolutional parts. And uh, here we're just normalizing the input data. OK, so we will go into what all this stuff here means in the technology talk parts of this uh, class. OK, here is the logic of NVIDIA's uh, uh, tutorial. The, the ultimate goal is to Change the position of the steering wheel so the car is driven in the right in the right way, and uh, we train. We take the data from the three cameras, feed it in. We do shifts and rotations. That's the standard trick to generate more data by taking uh, ex existing data and moving them around. Like if you want to be certain to recognize a cat, you know, however the cat is. Uh, Whatever the angle the cat is in the in the image, or whatever the distance, you take one photo and then you just rotate it and 
put it into the distance and things like that. And so here we have the training, and then when we that train tells you the the, the model, namely the value of the neural network weights in this picture we had on the previous slide. Then in the inference, we take just the center camera, I'm not quite certain why we don't use the left and the right, feed it into the, the model and get out the, the instructions. Um, okay, here is a typical of what this sort of these cameras will tell you. They will tell you the lanes. They will tell you things on the road. And they will tell you road signs. And they will, these road signs are directional and also speed. And you better know whether the speed is miles per hour, kilometers per hour, or whether it's just the name of the road, US 55, or Beijing into Highway 55, or wherever we happen to be. Okay. There is an amusing article, maybe amusing by who writes this, by high school student is proud that uh, he's not allowed to drive because he's not old enough, but he can teach cars to drive. There's no age limit on that. And this particular article distinguished rule-based and learning-based driving. Learning just takes the input and trains the car to do the same as the human. Rule-based is more systematic, it takes the input divides it up into these different things, the traffic sign, the cars, the pedestrians, planning the path, and then it designs the output. This uh, article is built around Steve, the NVIDIA system we described. And there is another article I noted here, a totally different one on sensors, which is pretty useful. So there's just lots and lots of articles. And I didn't mention here the one of why which is certainly obvious to me when I try to drive my car. Driving in bad weather is terrible. And pelting rain, snow, that makes driving very hard. All right, so here's an amusing picture to show that uh, Jaguar wants um, their cars to be loved. And uh, maybe people don't love self-driving robots because they're not human, and so they design their car to be such that people love them. And they not only pay AI engineers, but they pay cognitive psychologists to design their next generation self-driving cars. Um, so this is a UK auto drive project. That sounds like a self-driving project. Uh, here's uh, Mercedes-Benz, a much more classic, uh, smooth picture of a beautiful car. A smooth, uh, nicely aerodynamically designed to go real fast. Here is Otto, which is Uber's self-driving truck. Um, I think it has a driver in there, presumably that's required at the moment. And um, there's just lots and lots of these pictures on the web and actually exist things existing of prototypes in this field. Everybody has prototypes. Here's an interesting thing I found on medium.com by the chief executive officer, uh, John Kraft Kick of Waymo. And um, they, they, they just announced that uh, their vehicles have driven 10 million miles um, on public roads. A lot of those, presumably most of them had actually compulsory humans in the car to, to correct if the self-driving car went bonkers. And um, of course, that 10 million miles is what put into the network and it's more driving than a human, but have humans learn to drive it with just, um, I don't know, hundreds at most of miles of driving. Uh, however, they're given a lot of, effectively, they do transfer learning. They're given some information by people who've already learned to drive. And um, the millions of miles were driven in 25 cities, including, they claim, the snow. And they go from um, the uh, cities to the um, rural areas. But they also have done 7 billion, which is um, almost a thousand times as much driving of simulated data. So when you're doing uh, designing a network, you can either take real data, observational data, or you can actually write a computer program that generates the data. And it is actually very common 
in uh, deep learning to use simulated data. Advantage of simulated data is somewhat easier to get the uh, tr correct training. Because when you have a simulated data, you certainly know exactly the right thing to do, because you know what the scenario is. And you know the best thing to do. Whereas if you actually train it to look like humans, the human may not drive correctly. So you might not train it correctly. Uh, anyway, there's um, really interesting that we almost have a thousand times much simulated data as real data. And um, what they point out, there's this technique called fuzzing, which is to take an existing situation, which is, a, say, a real situation, and then you apply a little computer program to, to, to uh, fiddle around with the data. I already gave you an example of that about rotations. One thing you can do with data is to rotate the aspects. Now, cars shouldn't get rotated. They're the same car. Uh, I mean, you know, cars have to have wheels on the ground. So it's, that, that particular transformation is not relevant. It's relevant for the cats, but not cars. And uh, so you can also get sort of corner cases, rare, rare scenarios, and uh, check that the software responds correctly. And um, Tesla has 1.28 billion miles on autopilot because they have the advantage. They have all they've sold quite a few cars, and presumably they're secretly recording a lot of the data from these cars, and um, using that to to, look, to train their network. Um, okay, so this is a slide on the future of the automobile industry. We've already pointed out one of the reasons we're doing this in the class is this whole industry is getting changed. Um, and here's yet another comment on the fact that people are giving up their own vehicles. And here we have just Lyft, which is the smaller of the US company, said a quarter of a million of its passengers actually have sold their own vehicle or decided not to buy a new vehicle because they're going to do ride hailing. Um, if you look at AI, uh, AI can drive the self drive the car, but it can also reduce production costs and um, interact with the automobile industry at all, at all aspects of its operation. And um, if you look at the entire sort of chain from design of a car to a, to, to selling and selling the car, then that's meant to, AI is meant to be able to save a lot of money, 173 billion. And presumably, it will actually do that work better. And of course, the self-driving technology is going to drive the major new industries, which is the industry which create a world when you only have self-driving cars, and you don't have your own self-driving car, you just hail it. And um, this self-driving technology is meant to be uh, 556. I wonder how they got that. They know it's 556, not 555, or maybe even more modestly, 500 billion opportunity. And it's meant to grow at almost 40% compound annual growth. And it's 54 billion uh, last year. And uh, of course, AI also can be used to analyze monitors on the car. I'll see where maintenance is needed, and also, of course, to optimize the routes. This part, the route optimization, we'll discuss more in the section on the transportation system. All right, here's some sort of interesting plot I found, uh, which um, looks at where at the different parts of the um, of the automobile, or let's say, mobility industry and looks at the value added, which is high or low. And it thinks that actually making traditional cars is a very low value added. It's too easy to do as well established, not much innovation. Here we have um, the self-driving hardware and software. That's a huge value added. And just using AI to improve the relationship with customers and the maintenance and things. Is, uh, import, is another high value, and basically creating the future, which is a self-driving fleet of cars. And somebody, I mean, I should point out the rental car industry is also part of this mobility industry, because future rental cars will be self-driving. And here is an interesting comment about why it's good to not own your own car. So 
If you have a personal car, the average usage is meant to be 5%. Whereas if you have a fleet of cars which are, which are either driven by other drivers or self-driving, the, the uses can be more like 50% because it's only down when it's needed to be maintained and things like that. And uh, so that just says that it's a dollar a mile for a, a personally owned vehicle and uh, 30 cents per mile for a fleet. And that's an average saving of about $7,000. And this means, this gives you this as a service term, popularized by infrastructure as a service in computing. Here you have transportation as a service. And that, if you like, is what a mobility company offers. And this uh, curve on the uh, right here is a smile curve. It looks like a smile, does it not? And we want to be at the end of the smile, not in the middle. The middle has no value. All right, here we go. Here are some pictures of various uh, um, document quantifications of what we discussed. Here's Waymo, we already mentioned they'd uh, driven a million miles uh, total, uh, 10 million miles, sorry, already. And here it actually only goes through 2018. And it looks at the, which is the number of miles in California. Um, and uh, this, this is the disengagement rate, how often you have to uh, have human intervention. So that says in 2018, the disengagement rate for Waymo was 0.09 per 1,000 miles, which says the disengagement happened around every 11,000 miles, 1,000 over 0.09. And here is a more precise version of that uh, AI through the whole um, automobile industry value chain from research and development through manufacturing. And it appears, and here we have sales and marketing and things like that. And here we have the semi and fully autonomous vehicle shipments, uh, half, a, uh, half a million in 2019, almost a, a million in 2020, going up to 2.6. I'm sure these numbers are not very accurate. Well, these probably are accurate, but well, actually they're all estimates, so they're all pretty inaccurate. But they give you a feeling for what's going on. Rapid growth, but still relatively small compared to totals. Okay, now we come to some Pacific uh, industry players. Uh, first is Waymo, which is the uh, part of Google that uh, does self-driving and is effectively its own company. And um, but presumably if it has Google investments, else it wouldn't be able to keep going. And it has by far the most experience of pure self-driving without some humans. If you like, Tesla might have one of the biggest experience of, sem of semi-autonomous self-driving where there is a human involved. And um, they, they launched their ride hailing service uh, in a modest way uh, over a year ago. You know, by the way, I'm speaking in early February 2020. And <clears throat> Waymo built the, both the software and the data systems. And they also designed their particular you know, set of LiDAR and other technologies. Remember, Tesla doesn't use LiDAR, Waymo and most other people do. And we have a little slide somewhere later on describing why LiDAR might be a good thing to do. And we've already shown they did 10 million miles of tests. Cruise is a serious company, quite big, and purchased by GM. So GM, rather than develop their own, uh, wisely invested. And uh, somebody was already along that path with um, startup funding. And um, that they were actually acquired them some time ago, 2016. And they hope to soon launch their own um, autonomous ride hailing service. Okay, here we have um, some comments on, uh, more comments on Cruise, pointing out that it not only works with GM, but also with Honda. Uh, car companies, well known, the companies form un uneasy, typically alliances with their competitors, uh, when both they and their competitor feel that, uh, you know, while well, it may be a shame to have Honda, but it's better to, to do this rather than let Tesla and Toyota or others get far ahead of both Honda and GM. So 
I am down to, and in fact, Honda has a non-trivial investment in Cruise. And so it's a long-term relationship. NVIDIA is a major player because it builds the hardware. This, and as we point out, there are other hardware uh, designs, but NVIDIA is the best known of the companies building hardware for artificial intelligence uh, based on their graphics cards, which uh, was found actually, actually at Indiana. This was first pointed out uh, by uh, Adam Coates, who worked with Andrew Ng at Stanford, that uh, the GPUs were very good for um, um, NVIDIA GPUs are very good for uh, deep learning. And uh, the NVIDIA has works with lots and lots of auto companies. And obviously, they're trying to get level five. Everybody is. Whether it's really level five, but I think actually it's going to be a best level four in the early 20s. Um, and um, the there's not so much money initially. But um, they certainly expect to earn quite a bit of money by 2025, which I think has um, is um, a realistic number. And also, I think for Nvidia to invest in this area is a good thing to do because there's a lot of money to be made here, and it's also reasonably prestigious to be a leader in this area. Here is a comment on Waymo and UPS. Um, which is a pretty recent, January 30th, 2020. And this is pretty short term and sort of very tactical. And um, UPS will use Waymo's technology um, to um, do self-driving on very defined routes. I mean, if you're doing sort of warehouses and things, then you have cars and trucks and things going on exactly the same route in a reasonably safe uh, environment because it's just that it's usually probably in, internal to a to a, a, a warehouse system or something, and so there aren't pedestrians or general public and things like that. And um, <coughs> they may uh, they claim they may move further, but uh, this is just being done in one place, Phoenix, Arizona. And um, DeepMind is just uh, used to be a company was purchased by Google and is. Where Google has uh, put a lot of its AI, puts a lot of its AI research, um, and we know that the, the autonomous truck market is going to keep on growing really fast. Um, and um, I bet it's actually more than 70 percent between 2020 and 2025. These estimates here. Uh, no, the, the way estimates get done, they probably get defined. They're done in defined fashion, but they're just not very um, impressive. I mean, they're not very reliable because there's far too many uncertainties. Who knows what? It only requires, just we saw with the coronavirus, uh, one little bat has cost uh, billions and tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. Sent a major country, China, into hibernation. And you can't forecast that. So there's lots and lots of uncertainties. And we really can't forecast the progress in self-driving. Here's Cruise, and they have another very recent uh, January announcement on their origin system, which is um, a concept. It's not a car, it's a concept. And um, notice what the design is. It doesn't actually have a beginning and an end, it just has a middle. And the people, it's like some some taxis or some uh, vans. It has a force. Uh, it has seats facing each other in the middle, and um, the displays showing what's going on. And of course, you couldn't drive that in legally in the U.S. at the moment, which is why it's a concept on its way to production. And as we noted, General Motors owns most of it. Honda has a 5% stake, 5.7% stake, and it is pretty advanced, having done a million miles in San Francisco. And this company is worth 19 billion, which is not bad. I mean, GM itself is only worth 
50 billion so that's pretty interesting so G i'm sure gm spent less than 19 billion so this was actually one of the probably the best thing gm did um and here's some totally nonsensical survey about what you want to do in a driverless car and obviously you probably want to do whatever you would have done anyway and what you do on trains and other things and you hope the ride is smooth enough to allow whatever you want to do so I don't think that's so exciting, but it just says that you want to do everything, including texting, emailing, using your cell phone. 